to make a decision to act decisively to stop Iran. Not much. We're running out of time. I can't tell you if it's a period of months or a few years. It's certainly no more than a few years. I picked up with the explosive charges with a timer, and I was smuggled by the Waqf police on the Temple Mount. In Islamic apocalyptic thought, Jerusalem has a special role as triggering global jihad. Israel, in Ahmadinejad's view, is the little Satan. The United States is considered the great Satan. We are both in the crosshairs of radical Islam. They think that by creating a world crisis that it will bring their messiah. The greatest danger that the world faces uh, is the arming of Iran with nuclear weapons. It was makes it so serious is that it's not conventional weapons in the hands of non-conventional government. When they decide to go down against Israel, that'll be the biggest mistake they've ever made because Israel has one thing that they don't have. God. We're telling about a much worse time than 9-11. The Bible predicts something in terms of an all-out conflagration of many nations. There are few leaders today who really understand that we are engaged in World War III. They are not seeing these scenarios of the end of days as something that will occur in a thousand years, but as something that might occur tomorrow. certainly blindsided by 9-11. And the question is, are we going to be blindsided by events that are coming? Jerusalem. It's a city of only 700,000. Israel. It's a country of only 7 million. Why then do they ignite so much passion? Why do they generate so many headlines? Why are the eyes of the nations riveted here? explain the momentous events shaking our world and shaping our future. Israel is the epicenter of the world. Jerusalem is the epicenter of Israel. And the Temple Mount is the epicenter of Jerusalem. The epicenter is really the Temple Mount. And who's going to own that Temple Mount? Is it true that Shiite Muslim leaders believe the end is near? Do they really believe the way to hasten the coming of the Islamic Messiah is to annihilate the United States and Israel. Why is Russia selling arms and nuclear technology to Iran, the most dangerous terrorist regime on the face of the planet? Why do a growing number of Americans believe that the emerging alliance between Russia and Iran could set into motion the fulfillment of a 2,500-year-old Bible prophecy there are a lot of political and economic reasons why people have come to try to take over uh, this country and this city. When you look at Israel, Jerusalem, and the Temple Mount through the third lens of Bible prophecy and the scriptures, you understand that because God chose this city, this country, and the Temple Mount for his own, uh, the enemy, the, whom the Bible calls Satan, has chosen it as well. This interest in Bible prophecy is not unique to the United States of America. I think as we become more and more of a global community, uh, it's a concern of people all around the world in every nation, no matter where they are. Bible prophecy is always relative to one single nation, and that is the nation of Israel. And this is why it's the focal point of human history. This is why it's the focal point of our headlines, because it's a supernatural battle. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take you inside the epicenter. The Temple Mount is just above us, one of the most recognizable scenes in all the world. This is the foundation of the Temple Mount. Straight ahead, exclusive interviews with Israeli political and military leaders, 
I think the West fundamentally misunderstood and still misunderstands the threat of radical Islam. We need awakening, otherwise it'll be too late. A former PLO terrorist. My mission was to uh, destroy Bank Laoumi in Bethlehem. Top Middle East analysts, religious scholars, and Shiite Muslim converts to Christianity. They may tell your family you're there in jail, but they may execute you. The Jews refer to this spot as Har Habait, the mountain of the house, and it's because the house of the Lord, the temple, stood here. There's an interesting passage in the Midrash, an ancient piece of Jewish literature, that says, at the center of the world is the land of Israel, and at the center of the land of Israel is the city of Jerusalem, and at the center of the city of Jerusalem is the temple. So in the minds of the ancients, it was this spot that was the very epicenter of all of civilization. Through these walls lies the foundation of the Temple Mount. Not long ago, Muslim authorities excavated a huge area for an underground mosque with the capacity of 30,000 people. The building of this new mosque has just caused an uproar from the historical and archaeological community. If for no other reason than you have dirt being taken out of the ground by the, by the tons that could have contained and certainly did contain and does contain uh, artifacts from probably the first and second temple periods. On the temple mount behind me stood some significant structures. One was the temple built by King Solomon. Later on, after that was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC, Zerubbabel came and rebuilt the ancient stones that laid in this area. But many years later, under the time of the Romans, Herod the Great pursued a very aggressive building project and flattened this mountain and a 36 acre complex was built. That was the temple that stood during Jesus' time. And Jesus predicted that the temple would stand in the end times. But something drastic happened. In 70 AD, this structure was destroyed by the Romans. It's never been rebuilt again. Instead, as you can see behind me, stands a significant Islamic mosque. One of the really sad things that have happened in the modern era is that you can't even take a copy of the Bible, Old or New Testament, uh, with you when you go up on the Temple Mount. Even going up on the Temple Mount is restricted uh, as a Jew or as a, as a follower of Jesus. Uh, and it's sad uh, because this is a spot that God has chosen to be holy and, uh, and those who worship uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, are severely restricted in this current environment. Jerusalem, 70 AD. The Roman Empire destroys the holy city and tears down the second Jewish temple stone by stone. In an explosion of fire and tears, the Jews are expelled from the Holy Land and scattered across the earth. Despite their exile, the Jews maintain their unique social and religious customs. They are neither annihilated nor assimilated. They cling to each other and to the promises made repeatedly throughout the scriptures that in the last days, Israel will be reborn as a country. Jews will pour back into the Holy Land after centuries of exile and ancient ruins will be rebuilt. What is different about the Jews is that they refuse to conform to uh, the patterns of uh, destruction and disappearance that uh, afflicted other nations that were overtaken. Uh, and uh, in our dispersal, we, we said year after year, we next year in Jerusalem, we want to come back to, to this land that you see uh, around you. Uh, and, uh, and it's defying these laws of history. Uh, uh, with the, the faith and purpose that we had that enabled us to get back here. In the wake of the pogroms in Russia and the Holocaust in Europe, Jews are returning en masse to their ancient homeland. When you stop and think about what the Jewish people were facing prior to the rebirth of the Jewish nation, being persecuted by the Nazis, six million of them exterminated in concentration camps. But then those horrific events 
actually played a part in causing the Jewish people to realize we've got to take care of ourselves. We've got to fend for ourselves. We can't depend on others to take care of us. So they returned back to their homeland. They are the only nation in the history of the world that has come back after 1,700 years of losing their homeland. No nation in history has survived more than three, at best, 500 years. But here the Jews all over the world have been brought back in my generation into the Holy Land, and they are a separate people. They're a nation. First time in 1,700 years. That in itself is a miracle, but it's a fulfillment of God's promise and His faithfulness to Israel. Talking of, about the Lord's return was a little premature uh, prior to Israel's becoming a nation. And of course, once they became a nation, then the stage was really set uh, for the Lord to return. Jesus tells us to learn the parable of, parable of the fig tree when its branches are yet tender and it puts forth leaves. You know, summer is near. So likewise, when you see these things begin to happen, know your redemption is near. And, and of course, the fig tree in scripture speaks of the nation Israel. So her regathering in the land is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And that was really against all odds. With the eyes of the entire world watching in stunned amazement, Israel declares her independence. For the first time in more than 2,000 years, the Jewish people are once again a sovereign nation. The joy of independence, however, is short-lived. The Islamic world is enraged. No sooner has Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion declared the resurrection of the Jewish state than seven Arab nations attack with all their fury. Overnight, 800,000 Jews find themselves at war with 50 million Arabs. The fledgling Israeli army has not a single tank. Their enemies have 2,000. Yet amazingly, Israel not only wins their war of independence, but succeeds in establishing herself as the only democracy in the modern Middle East. Israel's enemies, however, do not give up. Instead, they regroup, rebuild, rearm, until they're ready to strike again. The leaders of the Arab world vow to throw the Jews into the sea. The Soviet Union sells the Arab powers $2 billion worth of arms, tanks, and fighter jets. Soviet military advisors flood the region, training Arab forces, and even designing a strategy to destroy Israel. June 1967, surrounded by Soviet armed enemies, and on the brink of another Holocaust, Israel strikes hard, fast, and without warning. In just six days, Israeli forces stun the world. They crush the combined Arab armies of Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. They quadruple their land, capturing the Sinai Peninsula, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and the Golan Heights. They reunify Jerusalem. They bring the Temple Mount back under Jewish control for the first time in 2,000 years. Some call it a triumph of Zionism, a tribute to the skill and cunning of the Israeli Defense Forces. Others call it a miraculous victory, the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. But for the Arab world, the Six-Day War is known as Al-Nakba, the disaster, and they vow revenge. In the months that follow the war, the Palestine Liberation Organization, led by Yasser Arafat, launches one terrorist attack against Israel after another. Meanwhile, the Arab states once again regroup rearm, and prepare to strike again. 
October 6th, 1973. The streets are quiet throughout Jerusalem. Preparations are underway for Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. Israeli soldiers are in synagogues, as is most of Israel's population. Then, all hell breaks loose. The combined Arab forces of Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and Iraq, aided by the Saudis, the Libyans, and others, launch a massive and devastating sneak attack. In the first week of the war, the Arab coalition makes stunning gains. In the north, a thousand Syrian tanks and 600 pieces of Syrian artillery mow down Israeli forces, aiming for Jerusalem. While in the south, some 400 Egyptian tanks cross the Suez Canal, wipe out Israel's forward defenses, and race across the Sinai Desert, also hoping to recapture the holy city. By the second week, however, momentum begins to shift. Amidst brutal, bloody combat, the Israelis retake most of the territory they have briefly lost. Soon, their forces are within striking distance of Damascus and Cairo. The Soviets begin a massive airlift of arms and ammunition to their Arab allies. The US, in turn, begins a round-the-clock airlift of arms and supplies to Israel, and then comes an ominous turn. October 24th, Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev sends American President Richard Nixon a chilling message. Force Israel to accept an immediate ceasefire, or the Soviet Union will take direct action against Israel. In response, the Pentagon orders U.S. nuclear forces to DEFCON 3, and President Nixon fires back a message at Brezhnev. We must view your suggestion of unilateral action as a matter of the gravest concern involving incalculable consequences. Faced with the prospect of a global thermonuclear war with the U.S., the Soviets finally back off. The Israelis agree to a ceasefire. The world steps back from the brink of disaster. Once again, Israel has miraculously survived. Since 1948, the eyes of the world have been riveted on the epicenter throughout one spasm of violence after another. Sadly, the history of the Middle East, both ancient and modern, is one of wars and rumors of wars. And now, a new crisis is brewing. In the world of radical Islam, uh, there are really only two categories. True followers of Allah, who are committed to jihad, to a holy war, and there are the infidels, uh, namely Jews and Christians, but they can also include uh, Muslims who are not committed as devoutly uh, to jihad as, uh, as the jihadists think they should be. In Islam as a dogma, the idea of salvation there is only one way that you can assure yourself to go to paradise. It's not like the Christian dogma in which you believe in the death of one Christ. By that, a sinless person who died on your behalf, you go to paradise. In this case of Islam, the way to assure yourself to go to paradise is by dying yourself as an offer to God. <laughs> I was recruited by Mahmoud al-Mughrabi, whose relative was Dalal al-Mughrabi. She was a proud suicide martyr, if you will, who killed 36 Israelis in a bus operation. Her relative, Mahmoud al-Mughrabi, was a bomb maker. He assembled explosive charges in the old city of Jerusalem in Babel Wad Street. 
and I picked up with the explosive charges with a timer and I was smuggled by the Waqf police on the Temple Mount. These were supposed to be the guardians of the Temple Mount, Muslim police. Yet they knowingly allowed me entry into the Temple Mount compound to smuggle the explosive charges to go out from a staircase to avoid the checkpoints in the old city of Jerusalem so I can deliver the explosives to Bethlehem in which my mission was to uh, destroy Bank Laumi in Bethlehem. Islam is not just a faith and a religion. It's a way of life. It's uh, mixed with politics, culture, religion is all in one. So when you're born in an Islamic family, you have no choice. You are it. And it intermingles with your identity. So it is different. There are people who are born in a, into a Muslim family, but not, they're not following Islam, but they are Muslims. I mean, it, because Islam is in them. It's a part of their identity. It's a part of the culture. If you study the Quran and Mohammedanism and study the Bible, you realize that he didn't get very many original ideas. I know they were satanically inspired, but uh, they have all kinds of, of uh, imitations of the Bible. Mohammed presented himself to the Jews as their Messiah and uh, that he was the promised Messiah and they rejected him. And so then he presented himself to the Christians as the second coming of Jesus Christ. And they rejected him, and so he then turned both against uh, the Jews and the Christians. And of course, there has been that uh, kind of desire to destroy uh, Judaism and Christianity by the Muslims ever since. A Muslim always is worried about his relationship with, with God. There's no peace. It, we're afraid of God. Fear has no peace. You know, a Muslim is always afraid of what Allah would do to them. So uh, Islam, even though it says a religion of peace, it cannot and has not brought peace to people's lives personally, to families, to their relationship with others, and with their relationship with, with God. eschatological teaching in the Islamic studies department focused so much on the Jews gathering in Israel and the surrounding nations, the Muslims, will attack them and then the trees will cry out and the stones will cry out. There is a Jew hiding behind me. Come, a Muslim, come and kill him. That's a well-known thing in all our schools that we learn. What's driving Iranian foreign policy right now is a belief, a strong belief, particularly among the leadership in Iran, that the Islamic Messiah is coming. Uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad believes that the 12th Imam, or the hidden Imam, uh, is imminent. He has been telling people that he believes the end of the world is just two or three years away, that the uh, way to hasten the coming of this uh, Mahdi, or this Messiah, uh, this 12th Imam, is to annihilate Israel and the United States. And he has been rallying uh, his forces, uh, his public, uh, to get ready for the coming of the Messiah. Ahmadinejad comes out of a cult in the Shiite Islamic world, which was actually illegal during Khomeini's time. And this cult believes in the impending return of the 12th or hidden Imam, a kind of messianic savior for the Shiites uh, who is supposed to come to power in the aftermath of tremendous uh, wars and an Armageddon-like scenario. The danger of Ahmadinejad is that he believes that this apocalyptic scenario can be accelerated by men. And he believes that the destruction of Israel is part of the key first steps to realizing this apocalyptic scenario that will lead to Islamic rule over the whole world. He has said publicly that when he was giving a speech at the United Nations in the fall of 2005, that he was surrounded by an angel of light, a halo of light, 
and that for the 25 or 26 minutes in which he was speaking, that not a single person in the UN General Assembly Hall blinked, so mesmerized were they, he said, by the voice of Allah speaking through him. The uh, head mogul at uh, Iran, the premier, he, he thinks he's the John the Baptist of the, Israeli, the, the Arab world. He's, he's heralding, getting these, all, all these people together, and he's actually the forerunner of the imam of the 12th century that fell down a well or somehow vanished and they thought he was going to come back, and they, they imitate the story of Jesus Christ. Westerners now are familiar with the word jihad, but they have not familiarized themselves with the term hudna, H-U-D-N-A, in which you establish what is called ceasefire with a non-Muslim entity. But you must break the ceasefire because you're not permitted in Islam to have a, an everlasting peace resolution with a non-Muslim entity. I was on the streets of Tehran, as you might recall, students shouting death to Shah, death to America, and I was a part of it. And uh, what we felt was if um, Islam takes over, that's the only way we could kick out Shah and we could kick out U.S. out of Iran. That's why religious and non-religious, they're all united behind Islam. We're now seeing the true face of that religion. It's like the mask has come off. And now it's being revealed. All that was said in the past about being fair and loving and equitable, when that mask comes off and you have large numbers, not a small minority, large numbers of terrorists willing to kill and asking for your sons and daughters to kill. When I used to work with the PLO here in the heartland of America in Chicago, I was a translator. And I remember making like parties in which we raised funds funding for terrorism and the uh, English posters in English they would say uh, something totally different than the Arabic the Arabic will be saying that we're gonna recruit uh, you know fighters to fight in Lebanon uh, death to America death to Israel what have you all this elaborate stuff rivers of blood and everything like that and then in the English it would simply say translation of that it would say, you are welcome to come and join us in a Middle Eastern cultural party. We will be serving lamb and baklava. In the Islamic eschatology or end times theology that's driving uh, Ahmadinejad and his followers right now, they believe that it's their responsibility to give infidels a warning, to convert or die. And then if the infidel world does not respond positively, then the end will come and they are supposed to hasten that end by launching apocalyptic wars. that crazy ideology in charge of a country that is developing atomic weapons is unbelievably dangerous and it should stop. Everything else is secondary to this. Historic hatred of Israel rampant throughout the epicenter. The rise of radical Islam. An Iranian regime convinced that the end is near and feverishly trying to build, buy, or steal nuclear weapons. It's a recipe for disaster. It's also raising intriguing new questions in the U.S. and around the world about the relevance of ancient Bible prophecies that suddenly seem as real as today's headlines. More than 2,500 years ago, the Hebrew prophet Ezekiel described a future war in the Middle East that Bible scholars have called the War of Gog and Magog. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, 
set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords, Persia, Cush, and Put with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer with all its troops, Beth to Garma from the remote parts of the north with all its troops, many peoples with you. And you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It shall come about in the last days that I will bring you against my land. One of the prophecies that most intrigues me in the Bible is Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, what Bible scholars call the War of Gog and Magog. A Gog, we find out, is not a personal name. It's a title, like a pharaoh or a czar. Now, he is the leader over a territory called Magog. The Magogites, the people of Magog, are the people whom the Greeks called Scythians. These are the people group who uh, settled north of the Black and Caspian Seas in what we now call Russia and the former Soviet republics. So what we're talking about with Gog is a Russian dictator, someone who's going to oversee uh, Russia as they begin to form an alliance with Iran and a group of other Middle Eastern countries to attack Israel, to try to destroy or annihilate Israel in the last days. When you look at events in the Middle East through a third lens of Bible prophecy, sometimes things, dots begin to connect and you can begin to anticipate what's coming. I think it's interesting that after Rosh is referred to, which can, can be almost indisputably proven to be Russia, uh, then you have the uh, Persia. Well, in 1930, is when they changed the name to Iran. It had been Persia up until that time, so we're still talking about the same place. In, in the 2,500 years since Ezekiel wrote the prophecy, Russia and Iran have never had a, a military alliance of anything like what's developing now. They have been close allies for some time. They have funded their weaponry. They have backed some of their policies. They have built reactors for them or are in the process of building reactors for them, nuclear reactors. So there is an alliance that certainly could trigger a movement. I really believe that we are on the very verge of uh, Ezekiel 38 being fulfilled and 39. I think that uh, the alignment of the nations right now, Russia's support of Iran and of the other Muslim nations that are listed as the aggressors against Israel in chapter 38, it surely is all, the stage is set and uh, the, the nations are in place. The countries are aligning uh, Russia is one of the best friends of the Arab world right now. They used to be enemies, but now they're making friends because they've got a common interest. They want world domination. I guess uh, the Russians have made them think they can trust them, and the Arabs think that they, they can that have convinced the Russians that they can trust them, but I wouldn't trust either one of them. But it's going to be interesting to see how these two get together and go down against Israel, and then the world abandons Israel and only God can save them. There is a tension this world is feeling, an exasperation. We have tried everything possible, especially in the last generation, to see peace occur in the Middle East, to solve this Israeli-Palestinian issue. And we have not gotten any further down the road in terms of peace. In fact, I would say we've lost ground. And there comes a point when nations, when governments, when organizations, who have tried and tried and spent money and lives have been lost in the process, finally give up. And they look for an expedient solution, not always the best solution. They're willing to try or do anything. And uh, some nations, unfortunately, in the mix, are talking about a nuclear solution. While they may or may not believe in the biblical War of Gog and Magog, even leading Middle East experts recognize the danger of the alliance that is now forming between Russia and Iran an alliance that is forming for the first time in the 2,500 years since Ezekiel wrote his prophecy. When you look at the whole uh, development 
of the Iranian missile program, their procurement of cruise missiles from the Ukraine, it is clear that Iran is looking far beyond Israel and far beyond Tel Aviv. Their aim is the West as a whole. They want to concentrate on completing their nuclear program because once they have that, then they could, uh, they could threaten the West in ways that are unimaginable today. They could take over the Persian Gulf on all its sides and take uh, control of the oil uh, reserves of the world, uh, or most of them. They could topple Saudi Arabia and Jordan in short order. And of course, Iraq. All, all your internal debates in America on Iraq would be irrelevant because a nuclear-armed Iran would uh, subordinate Iraq in two seconds. The Russian interest, to my mind, is first of all to become back a player in the superpower games, to become superpower. And as long as they don't have positive assets to play with, they use negative assets to challenge the United States. I was sent, in fact, by Israeli government, by Benjamin Netanyahu, to, to warn Russians about the dangers of leakage of their technology already in January 97. And in fact, I was the first minister who studied this, and then I happened to be, I think, the first former prisoner of conscience in the Soviet Union ever who came back to visit his own prison, and then to meet the head of new KGB, Putin, and later uh, the president, in negotiating the, or uh, insisting on the necessity of cooperation. It poses uh, a threat, in my judgment, uh, in many ways bigger than Nazism because um, Hitler embarked on a world conflict and then sought to uh, achieve nuclear weapons, whereas the leading radical Islamic regime, Iran, um, is seeking to first acquire nuclear weapons and then embark on a world conflict. Uh, and that is uh, what is not yet understood uh, in the West, and certainly if it's understood, it's not acted upon. This is Yad Vashem the world's largest repository of information and documentation about the Holocaust. Over six million Jews were brutally slaughtered in one of the most grim periods of European history, including one and a half million children. Before and during World War II, Jews throughout Europe were the target of merciless state-sponsored persecution. In 1933, nine million Jews lived in 21 European countries. By 1945, two out of three European Jews had been murdered. When the smoke finally cleared, the terrible truth came out. The Holocaust brought about the extermination of one-third of the worldwide Jewish population at the time. Following the German invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, mobile killing units following the German army began shooting massive numbers of Jews on the outskirts of conquered cities and towns. Seeking more efficient means to accomplish their obsession, the Nazis created a private and organized method of killing huge numbers of Jewish civilians. Extermination centers were established in Poland. Millions died in the ghettos and concentration camps through starvation, execution, brutality, and disease. Of the six million Jews murdered during the Second World War, more than half were exterminated in the Nazi death camps, and the names Treblinka, Auschwitz, and Dachau became synonymous with the horrors of the Holocaust. More than 60 years have passed since the Holocaust took place. Millions of pieces of evidence, documents, and photographs have been collected and are on display for all to see. 
It's difficult to believe, but there are still some who doubt or even deny that the Holocaust even took place. One of the ironies of the rhetoric of Ahmadinejad is on the one hand he denies the Holocaust, and yet he seems to be calling for yet another Holocaust in order to trigger the return of the lost Imam. Should he develop or buy nuclear weapons and match them with the high-speed uh, missiles that he currently has, Ahmadinejad could do in six minutes what it took Adolf Hitler six years to do, and that is to kill six million Jews. And that is not his ultimate objective. He has said he wants to wipe Israel off the face of the map, but he's also called on the Muslim world to envision a world without the United States. And he said, is this possible, a world without America and without Zionism? And he, he said, yes, it is, when our holy hatred strikes like a wave. The problem is, is lack of clarity in the West. Actually, Western people are sleeping. People in the West do not feel like they are engaged in World War III. But they are now attacked. They are under a jihadist offense. Only a few leaders understand it. And we need to wake up. We need awakening. Otherwise, it'll be too late. This is the nightmare scenario, that the most radical Islamic extremist regime that is already the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism, that is now fully entrenched in the most violent way in Iraq, killing thousands of innocent people, that has called for wiping Israel off the map, that an end to the United States, that has this global Islamic rule agenda and believes in the end of the world, would now get the nuclear bomb. If you look at all the operations from 9-11, the 10 airplanes, all these operations, there's one thing in common in all of them, and that is, they want a grand finale. They don't want to simply put a bomb in a bus or in a mall. They want a grand finale. They want one operation that kind of cripples America once and for all. As horrible as 9-11 was, experts tell me their nightmare scenario is for a single 10 kiloton nuclear bomb to be detonated right here in Washington, right by the White House, which could kill 300,000 people in a matter of minutes and destroy everything within a half mile of where I'm standing. Just imagine the announcement that there is a container ship afloat somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean containing either weapons of mass destruction or containing uh, even short-range missiles. It would certainly uh, set off a panic among uh, many people. And if uh, the United States was considering military action against Iran at some point in the future, and in the uh, Iranians could boast that they had container ships with missiles, this might uh, uh, forestall uh, action by the U.S. or any of its allies. You think that these people are normal. You think that Iran would conform to the conceptions of deterrence and careful calculation of cost and benefit. But in fact, it is part of that stream of radical Islam, in this case Shiite stream. But you've already seen what the Sunni stream does, which is to smash into buildings in Manhattan with uh, collective suicide, to smash into the Pentagon with collective suicide. And um, there's no reason to believe that the militant Shiites, once they have atomic weapons, will not be suicidal. This is a threat for all the free world, not for the one another candidate, not for one another country, but for all the free world to remain free. Back in 1998, the U.S. Congress, both the Democrats and the Republicans, put together a commission analyzing the vulnerability of the United States to ballistic missile attack from third world countries. This commission, which received material from American intelligence sources, concluded that the Iranians could build an intercontinental range missile that could strike the eastern seaboard of the United States within five years of taking the decision of doing so. And it wouldn't be clear to American uh, intelligence and military uh, leaders 
that in fact the Iranians had taken that decision. The confrontation with this regime is inevitable and it's going to be a military one rather than a political one because of the lack of determination when it comes to international community to deal with it by political or economic means. And we can't avoid it unless we are going to give up our way of life, our values, our culture. To take strong action against Iran, first in the form of sanctions, and second, if those don't work, uh, using other means is something that would be criticized, perhaps severely criticized. By the way, less so in the Arab and Muslim world. They just want it to happen. They're begging it to happen. But in the sort of polite, politically correct opinion uh, salons that never get it right, uh, in the West, you'd be criticized. But you'd be saving the world and probably saving millions and millions of lives. Israel, in Ahmadinejad's view, is the little Satan. The United States is considered the great Satan. We are both in the crosshairs of radical Islam. signs of the, the times are right at hand and things are falling into place like Russia and, and the uh, Arab world working together, they're the best of friends. I don't know how they can trust each other but they're getting together and they'll settle their differences later I suppose they think. Russia has been deeply involved and of course in arming uh, the whole uh, you know Syrian uh, and uh, the Iranians and uh, all they're deeply involved already in the Middle East, and it's just a matter of time. The Bible, with all of its predictions, uh, centers all of those prophecies as occurring at a particular period of time, and once they start occurring, they're going to occur very rapidly in succession, and it's principally centered in the Middle East. I would say that uh, American interest in Bible prophecy is increased over the years. Of course, there's a whole new generation that's hearing it for the first time, but I think for those of us who have always believed in it, we have only become more confirmed in our belief because everything that we were talking about maybe 30 years ago is happening in a more vivid way today. 42% of all Americans said they agreed we are living in the last days. A remarkable 52% of all Americans said they agreed that the rebirth of Israel is a sign prophecy has been fulfilled. I think we've been looking for a coalition of forces led by Russia and Iran to begin to surround Israel and move their forces to try to destroy Israel. Russia is supplying them. They're, they're making the Iranians and the, not just the Iranians, the other Arab countries around there are falling into place and they're making them dependent on Russia. Russia's tanks, Russia's airplanes, Russia's equipment, and uh, that's what Russia has to offer them. You'd be watching for a czar to rise in Russia, a dictator who begins building a military alliance uh, with Iran. I think that's already starting to happen, but I think we're gonna see more headlines along, uh, along that track. The two things that they have in common is, one, they hate God. I know they talk a lot about Allah, but that's not the God of the Bible, the real God that exists. And so they have that because Russia is an atheistical country, at least the government is. And they also hate the Jews. They, they have an, an unnatural hatred for the Jews. 
just like the Old Testament said they would in the last days. Another uh, series of headlines we should be watching for are more examples of Muslims coming to faith in Christ uh, in record numbers. Uh, that is not a story being reported much in the West yet, but it will be in the months and years ahead. It's happening in pockets of Muslim groups, but in Iran, it's a whole country. So it's happening here and there, you know, Algeria and other people groups in different countries, but in Iran, it's a major movement. When I went to the Middle East recently and I met with pastors from five Arab nations, Islamic countries, these are pastors who live, they serve, they work among Muslim communities and are persecuted in large part by them. I was absolutely stunned when I heard person after person tell me of a revival-like situation happening where they're at, where Muslims are coming to faith in Jesus Christ like never before. More Muslims are coming to faith in Jesus Christ today than any other time in human history. It's really an extraordinary story. I think a revolution is occurring without, with, throughout the Muslim world. In Iran, for example, there were only 500 known Muslim Believe, uh, former Muslims who believed in Jesus in 1979 when the Ayatollah Khomeini took over in the Islamic Revolution. Only 500 in all of Iran. Today, the Iranian pastors that I've interviewed say there are well over a million uh, believers in the country now and they're just coming to Christ in droves. Our television broadcast has had so much effect that has um, made the government alarmed. So it's under TV broadcast and the legislature uh, they have brought it up that this Christian television, we have to do something about it. And uh, they have done. They have made uh, owning a satellite dish illegal. And uh, yeah, it, it is illegal to own a satellite dish in Iran. So, but they, ca they cannot. They cannot stop it. What God has started, they cannot stop it. There's a lot of people in Iran that want to convert to Christianity, but uh, they're afraid. They're afraid that their friends or families or somebody they know that they're, what they're trying to do is going to tell on them to the government. I just want everyone to, to know that there is hope and that emptiness can just go away. You don't have to pay for it. It's free and it only, you can only find it through Christ. Just, just like I found it through Christ and how my life just changed so much. I am hearing that other people, Iranians especially, are getting visions about Jesus. So yeah, please pray for, um, for um, Iranians. Sorry. Please pray that uh, Ahmadinejad, the president, of Iran would come to know Christ. There is a possibility of persecution by family, but mostly government. But now the number of Christians inside Iran is so many that the government has stopped, for the most part, persecuting individual Christians, saying, you're a Christian, you go to jail, you're gonna be killed. That has happened, uh, but it's rare. For the most part, what the government does to a, to a Muslim convert to Christianity, you say, well, Keep it to yourself. The Jews are going to rebuild uh, the temple here in Jerusalem, and already we're seeing preparations uh, in the headlines. We see groups, Jewish groups, beginning to prepare already to rebuild the temple. For years now, there's been a movement uh, associated with what's called the Temple Institute uh, to build the laver, the menorah, other uh, the table of showbread, other kinds of furniture and furnishings associated with the temple. Now the temple itself was only 2,700 square feet. To replicate that building today would roughly cost $11 million. So we're talking about $4,000 a square foot. Why? Because Solomon believed this was the very spot that God dwelt and was to be worshiped. So there has been a movement to sort of in the wings have uh, the right implements, the right furniture, the right, uh, the required uh, uh, ceremonial kinds of trappings ready to go for the new temple at the time that it's built. And that has been underway for several years. I think the most dramatic headline that, that we're likely to see in our lifetime is that when this Russian-Iranian alliance comes to destroy Israel, 
that God supernaturally intervenes to protect Israel. You'll have all this hopelessness seen in the homes by TV of the uh, Israelis, and then all of a sudden God gives them victory, not through might nor by power, but by His Spirit. He will give them a victory. With pestilence and with blood, I will enter into judgment with Him, and I will rain on Him and on His troops, and on the many peoples who are with Him, a torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. I will magnify myself, sanctify myself, and make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am the Lord. That will be the most exciting event in the history of the world, when Almighty God shows He's really in charge. He's going to bear His arm and prove to all the atheists and the skeptics that deny His existence that He really exists. You will not find the EU, you will not find the UN, you will not find the US. But the scriptures say that God is gonna supernaturally intervene with fire from heaven and earthquakes and uh, pandemics, uh, the likes of which the world has never seen before. And it could happen in our lifetime. Meanwhile, inside the epicenter, the pressure is building and the clock is ticking. The tremors from the Middle East are being felt around the world. Anxieties are rising, and so are the questions. What if the Bible is true? What if recent events in Russia and Iran were foretold centuries ago? What if the ancient prophecies about Israel and her neighbors actually do come to pass? And sooner than anyone might imagine,